Hi, it's Tom Broussard. Good to see everyone uh, talking today about a new scientist named uh, Donald Hebb um, from Canada. Um, it is amazing if you've been watching the videos and seeing my articles for the last six, seven, eight months, um, how they are all incredibly connected with each other. Um, that's not to say they all live in the same country or in the same language, but it is interesting how over time um, they find each other, learn from each other, and continue, basically, as we used to say, standing on the shoulders of others before. Um, and Heb is like that. Um, it's it, To me, it's so amazing, that the fact that he grew up, born and grew up in Nova Scotia, um, and from his perspective with his family, um, his parents were both uh, medical doctors and his mom really liked um, Montessori. Um, so uh, Heb didn't go to school until later uh, because he stayed at home and was taught with the, um, with the curriculum, as it were, of Montessori, Maria Montessori, which is always amazing. Of course, this is 100 years ago. What you and I think about this as modern times, clearly modern for them, uh, but that was literally uh, 100 plus years ago in, in um, Nova Scotia. Um, but uh, of course, he Heb, um, did a lot of things. I mean, he obviously went on and got to, went to school um, and uh, at uh, schools that you would know if you know about Canada, um, Dalhousie in, uh, in, in Nova Scotia and uh, McGill, which everybody knows in Montreal. Um, but again, this is what I talked about earlier, that all these different scientists get to know each other at various uh, uh, countries. Um, in in uh, Head's case, he obviously had learned a lot about um, um, uh, Sherlington, who was, as you might remember, is from England. Uh, Sherlington knew a lot from um, uh, uh, various other countries, including um, Santiago Cajal in Spain. And then Hebb learned from uh, Shillington. And then he also learned from Penfield. You might remember Penfield as well, um, also from Canada. Um, the uh, And another person, uh, Lashley, you might remember him too, one of the earlier articles, meaning earlier in time as well, uh, from the United States. So it is quite amazing. And Hebb um, ended up getting his PhD from Harvard, um, had already been working under Lashley, the one we mentioned before in Chicago, um, then went back after graduating, went back to Montreal and started working for uh, Penfield, Wilder Penfield, who again was a Canadian American. Uh, Penfield went to Princeton, uh, undergrad, ended up, of course, in England, working for um, Shillington, actually went over to Spain and met Kajal. Uh, you get to see all this small world for all of these scientists, which to me is always amazing. Um, the, um, the, but when it came to Heb, it turns out that not a, at all unlike Dar Darwin, but everybody knows about Darwin, how famous he was, what he had done with evolution. Um, turns out that Hebb wrote another book, uh, incredibly famous to the people that are scientists in that kind. Not many people know about uh, Hebb's work and the uh, book called The Organization of Behavior. Um, everybody knows about uh, the evolutionary work on the origin of species by Darwin, excuse me, but not many, still not many people know about Hebbs, although he, he had done such groundbreaking work, excuse me, that, that now many, if not all scientists that study the brain um, understand just how important his work was. Um, and it's not unlike the groundbreaking work of Darwin with evolution. Um, the, um, but when it comes to Hebb and this saying that everybody knows called cells that fire together, wire together, which is a nice way to think about it. Um, but that is what he has um, espoused 
um, based on his his uh, master's thesis and then of course his PhD. Um, but basically, he he came to understand and had studied enough about the synaptic function because that's where everything happens. You have your cells, your neurons, neurons, and then you have your dendrites and synapses. Well, it's the synapses that do all of that work, making the communication between one cell and another. And that, that becomes the learning field. Um, and he has studied how all of that works together. And I'll read you this particular um, uh, sentence. And accepted, so this is his, this is his uh, understanding of it. An accepted and excited uh, neuron tends to decrease its discharge to inactive neurons and in, increase their discharge to any active neurons and therefore it to form a route to it um, and starts to the foundation of neuro roots and neuro groups um, because individual cells as incredibly smart as they are and powerful they don't do a whole lot unless until they are connected with other cells uh, and then they get bound together and that process of binding each other uh, basically those neuro roots that uh, that uh, uh, heb was talking about is to form these networks so that they stay together basically um, and they become um, again what heb talks about is the basis for thought um, through uh, what he had ex expressed in the organization of behavior. And that took him 17 years after he wrote his first paper about it um, and then spent 17 years trying to figure this out and write about it so others could better understand it. Because even now reading it, you have to read, I mean, reading the organization of behavior, you have to read that in my case over and over again um, so that you can better understand and let it seep into how you're considering what he was writing about in terms of the way the brain works um, and how uh, neurons and synapses uh, work. Um, the, um, but it was very interesting, another article called Heb and Darwin. So there you go. I mean, those two um, are masters of how they began to understand how uh, humans had evolved. Um, so I'll read from this, from the Heb and Darwin article. It is because synapses are so much more nimble and numer numerous than genes, than genes that mental adaptation is so much faster than physical adaptation. So um, it turns out that with human populations, um, the genes are for, for the world's human populations and synapses are the evolution for individual brains, as it were. Um, and he described, Heb described uh, three different things. One is called the Heb syntax. Um, and that's where he basically was telling us how any two cells in any system that start being active together, um, they start to make, they become associated, neurologically associated. And um, unless they've lost the stimulation that made them bind in the first place, then the more they do it, the more it stays there and they continue to um, uh, remain active together, building that root and building the, the, um, uh, the neuro network. Uh, the second thing he talks about is the cell assembly, um, what we now uh, already talk about the um, neuro um, uh, network, uh, but the cell assembly uh, is something very interesting because from his perspective and several other scientists have all chimed in over those last some hundreds of years, um, how they become a closed chain of neurons so that as they build that root, um, and you can see some of the uh, drawings of it, um, when one is connected with another and then it's connected with another and then those two are connected and it starts to build this, um, what they call this, reverberatorial circuit so that that becomes the basis of thought because as we are talking as you are listening as we are speaking clearly it doesn't just fall off after one activity or another one stimulus or another when we talk it is now ready for the next utterance so this is this cell assembly and this revelatory circuit that becomes the basis of thought 
So when we think about the train of thought, that is what he means. And neurologically, that is what he means, that this, this particular train continues. Not every minute, it takes more than that, more faster than that. The brain runs at about 4 billion flows a second. So it's in, obviously incredibly fast. And we have trillions and trillions of synapses, those connections. Um, so it is constantly um, working all the time, constantly active, and some are more active than others. And that's where it forms its own, uh, its own assembly, its own uh, network. And then the third one, of course, is the phase sequence, because if it does all that work and it does whatever it does to discharge information that becomes the thought that we all have, um, what happens next? So there must be what they, he talks about, this temporal um, uh, s s uh, sequence that allows that to happen, again, not every second, more every um, millionth of a second, boom, boom, boom and starts this phase of that, the phasing sequence, because it happens and it happens and it happens as we talk and we talk and we talk uh, going forward. So that is that particular sequence um, that, and again, I'll, I'll quote this here from another article, uh, Hebb outlined his concept of the phase sequence as a temporal organized pattern of cellular activity, which could be identified with a train of thought. So that is now you have the, the synapses, then the assemble, then that, that reverberatory circuit. So it continues to do what it's doing about, about that exact same thing, um, uh, forming the basis of thought. And then the phase uh, sequence of that, because it, it has to continue to do that uh, every um, millionth of a second going, going forward. So that is how he explains how our synapses work, um, how it has evolved, how it works on a day-to-day -day basis to, to make that um, uh, associative connectivity between not just individual cells, but all those cells becoming um, neural networks uh, through the uh, cell uh, assembly. Um, and as he says, and I'll add here at the end, um, the this is uh, quote by Hebb, uh, the, the position of the capacity for thought makes us a thought dominating species and learning dominating as a result. So this is how the brain works with our cells, as he said, that fire together, wire together. So that is Donald Old, Olden Hebb from, from Canada about 100 years ago. Uh, and you might as well be reading it today. Everybody should get this book today. Study this, read this. Um, this is one of the Bibles of evolution, at least when it comes to uh, the synapses and how the brain works. And of course, now we're talking about people with stroke and aphasia. Um, that is how the brain works when it comes to stroke and aphasia, because the remaining cells are healthy. Because uh, you don't have a disease, you have an impact, you've had a hit, um, and it does damage um, a little or a lot of cells are, are destroyed. Uh, but I've told you before, the remaining healthy cells have the capacity to grow new branches and leaves, otherwise called dendrites and synapses. They can grow more and more and more and continue to bind or rebind all of the existing cells that are already part of those networks, but they can then put in more information and begin to um, communicate in a way that you had before lost as a result of the stroke and aphasia, uh, whether it comes to speech or, or uh, the body uh, going forward. So this is Heb, and he is quite the person. Um, uh, next week, actually, it'll be another week. We'll have another article. It will be another person's mentioned in Hebs's um, article called Brenda Milner. Uh, she worked for Heb uh, and became again famous in her own way. Um, uh, from uh, and she is from England, but moved to Canada during World War II. So um, that's what's coming up. Coming up next. Nice to see everyone. So seeing everyone and see you next week.
Take care of yourselves. Have a good summer. Bye.